Hello and welcome to Reps to Gog, the last bastion of hope for humanity. Today I, Null Toxicity, will be talking about an action RPG by the name of Evergrace. Once again, I'm playing this game on PCSX2, a PlayStation 2 emulator. There were a few graphical bugs and messed up special effects, but I was able to get most of these resolved by changing my renderer and the video settings from OpenGL hardware to OpenGL software. Other than that, the game was completely playable, and you shouldn't have any other issues if you're playing on the NTSC American release. Evergrace was created by From Software, who brought us such hits as King's Field, Armored Core, and all of our favorite Souls type games. These guys have been around for a pretty long time, being founded in 1986, but they wouldn't start making video games until 1994, mostly for the PlayStation. The main credits to this game seem to go to Naotoshi Jin, Shinichiro Nishida, Masanori Takeuchi, Kiwamu Takahashi, Ken Sugiwara, and Junichiro Ishino. Although it seems like Naotoshi Jin was the CEO of the company, and both he and Shinichiro Nishida are credited as supervisors so I'm not sure how much actual creative vision they put into the game. Another thing to note is that Age Tech was the company that localized this game. They were actually responsible for localizing all three FromSoft PS2 launch titles. The localization is, uh, well, it's not that good, but I'll talk more on that later. First and foremost, when it comes to Evergrace, I must talk about the music. This game has a very unique soundtrack. I was at first very thrown off by it, but I came to appreciate it as it went on. The composer and sound producer behind Evergrace was someone by the name of Kota Hoshino. I found an interview where he talked about his part in Evergrace, and he mentioned his idea for the music was an expression of a voice. He wanted to make something that sounded not Japanese, and he also had the idea that he wanted to make something that was between pop and non-pop. This is all nebulous artists speak to me, but it sounds like he wanted to create something unique, and he did, so I applaud him for that. Although I wish he had done a better job with the boss themes, because I feel like they don't feel all too different from the rest of the game's music, but with that said, I, I actually did really enjoy the music. Evergrace will put you into the shoes of two separate characters, Darius and Charlene. They both have their own storyline that you can follow, and once both are finished, they intersect and you can continue the story with both of them together. Evergrace doesn't have a traditional RPG level up system. Instead your character gains power by equipping more powerful armor and weapons, and also upgrading said armor and weapons. However, to say that it doesn't let you level up, which is something that the game actually touts in the player manual, is actually kind of false. The game lets you gain stats in the form of red fruits, which give a permanent increase to strength, stamina, intelligence, resistance, or luck. These can be farmed from enemies, which means if you really wanted to, you could take all these stats from 0 to 999 just from farming enemies. There is also a durability system in the game. Everything you use is made of something called Palmyra. Palmyra is dropped from enemies when you hit them, and Palmyra shards are also used as currency. As you swing your sword, your durability or Palmyra goes down, and you'll have to have it repaired in the shop. You also have these things called Palmyra actions. These allow you to use special attacks or even spells from your gear. These also drain a specific amount of Palmyra per use. If you let your durability go all the way down to zero, your item will get a stony lake texture and it'll cost significantly more Palmyra shards to repair. This is fine on its own, my only gripe is that your armor actually deteriorates on a timer, so if you sit AFK and don't pause, you'll come back to all your armor completely busted. Speaking of attacking, Evergrace uses a stamina system which is also tied to your health bar. You'll use a certain amount of your stamina per attack based on how hard you hit the square button. The more stamina you use for your attack, the more damage it does. If you use a Palmyra skill, your stamina will take longer to regenerate. Since I couldn't use pressure sensitive buttons on the emulator because my controller doesn't support it, I set the sense to be 100 every time I attacked. The reason I specifically mention it being tied to your health bar is that it seems like the lower your health is, the faster you gain stamina back. Maybe I was being placeboed or something, but it totally felt like I was being rewarded for staying on low health. 
I'm not sure if this is intentional or not, but it wasn't mentioned in any sort of documentation or tooltip, so I consider it an oversight. By the way, do you like fashion souls? Evergrace allows you to show off your armor and weapons on your character, and you can even dye them to change their color in the store. This is pretty cool for the time this game came out. The standard in RPGs with named characters would be a static design and equipment just acting as a stat boost. I'm just saying, when I got a hold of my Dark Souls katana and got a sick drip going for Charlene, I was pretty happy with that. Did I mention the enemies? All the baddies you'll fight in this game are pretty easy. Aside from a few bosses, I really didn't find myself being challenged. The enemies only exist to be loot bags for you to farm in case you need the currency or whatever drop they have. Evergrace really wants you to buy these, like, monster index cards. Enemies each have their own unique weaknesses and strengths, such as being healed by a certain elemental typing or being weak to a certain type of damage. I found that it was easier just to see what works and what doesn't by blindly testing weapons against an enemy type and drawing conclusions from that. Also, what the fuck, Japan? Hentacle? An octopus monster that only attacks if you're looking away from it? That only shows up in the Charlene route? Come on. The boss fights in this game range from super easy to relatively annoying. I wasn't sure if I wanted to consider grappling with the game's controls and camera to be indicative of a hard boss fight, but the bosses that are difficult are only difficult for that reason. Each boss will have its own predictable set of moves, which are all way too telegraphed, and they'll also have a bunch of blind spots where they just can't hit you with any of their moves. It seems like this game is imploring you to cheese these bosses. With that said, with a few exceptions, each boss is unique and has at least a cool design going for it. I personally love how Red Breeze looked, despite him being a complete pushover. As you muscle your way through the story, you'll be given ample chances to flex your brain muscles too. Evergrace is filled with puzzles, and let me tell you, I fucking hate puzzles. Jigsaw puzzles, logic puzzles, word puzzles, they all suck, I'm sorry. I just can't get behind a lot of these RPG puzzles. This game wants you to think first, and if you can't figure it out, just try stuff until you brute force the puzzle. Oh, red door? Gotta open the door with a fire weapon on. Oh, but the red orb, you gotta hit that with an ice weapon. Oh, blue statue? Oh, you gotta go to the store and dye your armor blue and activate the statue. Oh, you wanna cross this lava? Better go to the store and buy the flying boots. Guard elevator? Better go to the store and buy the guard boots. I got stuck in an ice cavern for a while because I had to hit these stalactites with a fire spell, but I didn't have a fire spell, and I couldn't buy one. So I had to figure out that I had to farm Palmyra shards, which is the currency, to upgrade a weapon so that I could get a spell to shoot fire, and then finally I was able to melt the stalactites and move forward. Like, I don't mind out of the box puzzles, but I at least expect you to give me the tools to solve a puzzle within the level. Every single puzzle in this game required me to go back to the store, figure out what I needed to buy to specifically solve that puzzle. I consider this lazy level design and it creates a lot of unnecessary backtracking and a generally rocky experience. Also, very specifically, fuck that mirror puzzle. I only solved it through a dummy amount of trial and error and it almost made me put down the game. Other than the matter of puzzles, I do think the level design is relatively decent. There's a lot of nice things to look at in the game, especially the Trandon boss fight at the end. The combat in this game feels very, um, methodical, and not in a good way. Healing items are so cheap and available that even if you get hit, like, a lot, you'll still kill whatever you're fighting and gain enough currency from that one dude to get all your health items back. I found myself running around enemies and hitting them in the back a lot, and then running away to get my stamina back. If that didn't work, I was just finding the weapon with the most reach and just hitting things outside of their attack range. The spells don't even feel worth using. They have such a high wind-up time, are difficult to aim, and barely do more than a regular attack. I thought I would try doing spellcaster stuff in my Charlene playthrough, but it just didn't end up being good, so both characters end up playing exactly the same, with the only difference being what weapons Darius and Charlene acquire throughout their journeys. Hey, let's talk about them Darius and Charlene fellas for a second. Well, actually let's talk about the localization first, because I feel like it's necessary before getting into the character stuff. So the English voice acting felt really, really, really silly at times. It also felt like sometimes the scenes were being cut off because the scene was shorter than the dialogue, 
or the other way around, the scene sat awkwardly as the English dialogue finishes and doesn't move on to the next character. There are also a few spelling errors in the subtitles, which isn't a huge deal, but I think it's worth noting. What does annoy me is when subtitles say something and the voice actor doesn't say that thing. If you're going to change or shorten dialogue or whatever, you gotta at least make sure that the text matches up. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, I'm going to start talking about characters and story progression. This is going to have spoilers, but the game is like 20 years old and there's not really going to be any bombshell reveals or anything. Darius is a no-nonsense type sword guy who is seeking revenge for the murder of his parents and his childhood friend Charlene. Okay, so I realized in my original script I went on a painfully long-winded explanation of the story here and I felt like it wasn't particularly interesting, so here's the speed version. Darius has a cursed mark called the Crest. It's apparently really powerful. He ends up in a lost kingdom called Rubain. He's awoken by a human named Chrysalis. She tells him where he is and he starts his journey aimlessly. He saves this guy and gets into a castle. Also, this guy hates Darius because he has a cursed crest. What a dick. Darius will go through a maze and eventually make it to a priestess lady without a name. She tells you to go get some royal garb to continue on. Remember that old guy? Apparently he was the king of the castle you were in. He dies for whatever reason and gives you the clothes you need. Still a dick though. You'll end up at a coliseum. This is where Darius will meet Charlene. The game doesn't tell you beforehand, but they're childhood friends and he apparently killed her. But tales of her demise have been greatly exaggerated. Morpheus scoops Charlene up and leaves, and our hero Darius finally has a motive to push the plot forward. Halfway into his story. Who is Morpheus, you may ask? Well, you decided to play the Darius campaign first. You'll move forward and meet a dying man named Orladin. You won't know why he's dying or that his name is Orladin at this point because you chose to play the Darius route first. He gives you a gem to move forward. You'll meet Sienna and she'll tell you about how shitty it is to be a crest bearer, as if Darius didn't already know. She teleports you to a castle and you go meet Morpheus. He's got Charlene captive and you fight and defeat him. This is the end of the Darius campaign. Now to Charlene. Charlene also wakes up in Rubain. She was found by a lady named Sienna. A guy named Morpheus shows up and you can tell he's really evil. He instructs this floating child psychic named Trandon to kill Charlene. Sienna is able to talk him down and agrees to go with Morpheus in exchange for sparing Charlene. Sienna is also a crest bearer and Morpheus wants to use that to create an artificial crest. Charlene goes and meets the priestess without a name. She's told where to get Sienna back. Remember that king guy? You save his dog and he gives you a necklace to go to Morpheus's laboratory. Here you'll meet Orladin. You'll give him some first aid and he'll tell you where to find Morpheus's office. Morpheus tells Charlene that she's a cycle. I don't know what that means. Morpheus teleports away and you now have to fight a silver beast. Afterwards, you make your way through an obnoxious puzzle and meet this yellow-haired lady. She doesn't have a name and never shows up again. She activates a teleporter for you. You go through an area and fight your mirror self. No dialogue, just fighting. Afterwards, you'll end up fighting Sienna, but she's been possessed. Oh no! After this, you'll meet another crest bearer. I guess it's one of Morpheus' experiments. He tells you how cool you are and how nice you are for killing him. You'll then make your way up to Morpheus, who has Sienna captured. This is actually where Darius and Charlene's paths converge. Which is kind of strange because, well, Charlene couldn't have been doing all these things if she was captured at the time that Darius came as well. Alright, I think that about wraps it up. We'll talk about the end now. So now we get to fight two bosses at the end of the game. One with Charlene and one with Darius. The first boss is Chrysalis. Why is it Chrysalis? I have no fucking idea. It's not explained, almost to the point of beyond vague. Chrysalis barely had any dialogue, and the small amount that she did have never indicated that she would be a final boss for any reason whatsoever. I feel like she was literally put in as an afterthought. The boss fight is interesting and it's well done, but I don't know why I'm fighting this character and it sours the experience for me. The fight with Trandon is great and the arena is beautiful, but after the fight you just get a cutscene with Charlene and Darius visiting Trandon and Sienna's graves and then that's it, you know? You've killed every important character in the story and offered me no conclusion or explanation besides everyone's dead, hello, see ya. I'm not sure if this is a problem with the localization not explaining enough or translating things in a way that makes me not understand, or if it's a problem where the game is poorly written. Either way, I see it as a failure to deliver a compelling story. The FromSoft staff once considered Demon Souls to be the spiritual successor of King's Field. And if that's so, I would call Evergrace the spiritual distant uncle. Like he's there and you know he's related, he's got a pretty cool motorcycle, but he keeps rambling about stuff you don't understand and you kinda don't like being around him. So, you've got the choice between going to your finest Sheets eatery and picking up two hot dogs for one dollar or purchasing this game? What a conundrum. 
Let me tell you what Null Toxicity would do in this situation. You can get Evergrace for about 8 to 9 bucks on eBay, so that's about 16 to 18 sheets, 2 for 1 hot dogs. I got like 12 hours out of this game and I was having a little bit of fun. The game is filled with interesting systems and it's got a truly unique soundtrack. But with the combat being relatively boring and the story being a confusing mess with characters that are so vague and vapid, I can't with a good conscience recommend you guys buy this game. Get yourself 16 hot dogs, get some mayo and onions on them, it, it, it'll go further for you. Hey guys, Null Toxicity here. Remember that last review I made? You know the shtick about game manuals, well, I went through it again. No game manual to be found for Evergrace. However, this time I was streaming the game over on Twitch and this guy by the name of Inetervo came in and started telling me shit from the manual. I was giddy as shit and I DM'd him and he was nice enough to snap some pics of the manual for me and I just gotta shout him out because the manual has stuff in it that I would have otherwise not been able to share in the review. I'm gonna see what I can do to get this archived so people can find it somewhere. I, I really appreciate it, thank you so much. And with that said, um, I really hope you appreciate watching this video. Um, trying to push these out. It's, it's really hard to play PS2 games and live a normal life. Uh, it, uh, it turns out they're mutually exclusive. Y'all have a good one.